for those that have joined us, we're going to give it about a minute um, before we get started. So bear with us. We just want to allot a little bit of time for uh, individuals to log on if they're a little bit late. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, hello and welcome to the collaborative webinar entitled From Flower to Flame, Optimizing Cannabis Analysis with Microwave Digestion and ICP OES with CEM Corporation and Inorganic Ventures. Uh, I'll be your moderator for the day. My name is Brandon Cocker and I'm the head of regional sales here at Inorganic Ventures. I'm a degreed chemist with seven years in the field uh, with works ranging from head wine chemist in Napa Valley to a published co-author in the Journal of Forensic Science to Konings Chemist and more. Uh, these past nine years, I've operated in sales roles, seeking to assist others with solutions to problems they face in science. Uh, the purpose of this webinar is for the following. As cannabis product testing becomes crucial, especially for toxic elements like arsenic, cadmium, mercury, and lead, the demand for efficient methods is paramount. While ICP-MS is widely used, its complexity and high cost make ICP-OES an appealing alternative. Achieving trace level detection with ICP OES, maintaining productivity, and ensuring high throughput all present challenges. Our solution involves optimized microwave digestion, followed by a high efficiency sample introduction system, utilizing a high efficiency nebulizer and cyclonic spray chamber. Matrix matching of calibration standards and innovative analytical approaches enhance accuracy. Results demonstrate the capability of our methodology for precise analysis of cannabis samples at or below the, the uh, strictest detection limits. Join our webinar, which we're about to begin. And without further ado, I'll introduce the two speakers for today. Uh, first, we'll have Autumn Phillips. She is a research chemist and chemical hygiene officer at Inorganic Ventures. She received two bachelor's degrees from Virginia Tech in chemistry and biochemistry in 2016. She has both been with Inorganic Ventures for seven years, and her experience includes techniques in ICP OES, ICP mass spec, and ion chromatography analysis, along with a wide range of sample digestion purifications. Also, we'll have Dr. Alicia Douglas Stell as who works with CEM for the past 16 years, joining after completing her PhD in analytical chem chemistry. Her extensive background in chromatographic analysis and mechanical expertise have been integral in the development of both instrumentation and novel applications. In her role as market development manager, she is continuously exploring new applications and areas for innovative technology focused around sample preparation. Please submit all questions in the Q&A box, not the chat box, uh, and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. Ladies, the floor is yours. All right. Thanks, Brandon. I really appreciate that um, introduction. So um, this is a project that we undertook uh, with Inorganic Ventures, CEM, and Texas Scientific Products. Um, so I'll go ahead and if it'll advance. Sorry, having a little lag there. All right, so um, Brandon went through some of the reasons for the project. Um, so I'll just go through these very briefly. But um, again, heavy metals have traditionally been tested in cannabis and hemp products on ICP mass spec. Um, but ICP OAS is a little bit simpler. It's less expensive. Um, it's a little bit less maintenance as well. It can handle more robust samples that have higher concentrations of some of those more difficult compounds. Um, in the past, ICP OES has not been used, and that's primarily because it just hasn't been able to reach the detection limits that are needed um, for seeing those low levels of those um, heavy heavy metals. Um, so with the growing use and manufacturing of cannabis products, we're seeing a lot of different types um, of products and an increase in number of products. So it's becoming a lot more important to uh, make sure that you're testing these heavy metals accurately um, and able to have a high throughput in your lab for the samples. Um, we don't expect the regulations to uh, decrease. We actually expect them to increase um, with 
with, again, the growing use. Um, and we wanted to make sure that these labs are able to test these samples um, and get those through quickly because there's going to be um, expected to be a greater number of those samples that they're going to have to get through. So the first part of our experimental design is, of course, microwave digestion. Um, we needed to get the sample into solution in a way that we aren't introducing any additional contaminants. Um, and we also want to make sure it was a closed vessel method um, to where we're not losing any of those volatile species like arsenic and mercury primarily. Um, we did use a higher sample size for this than is normally used for ICP mass spec applications. So normally you would use a half gram of a sample, um, but we used one gram so that we could really minimize that dilution factor and see as much of these um, elements in there as possible. Um, we also only diluted to 15 gram final weight. Normally it would be 100x dilution. So 0.5 grams to 100 gram or 50 gram final. Um, we used more nitric acid as well. Um, and that's just to ensure that we had a complete digestion. So if we had used a lower amount of nitric acid, we would have probably had residual, more residual carbon and also um, probably solids, uh, particulate matter in that sample. So um, we did use a high purity nitric acid as well um, because lead is a common contaminant in nitric acid. So um, we also added 0.3 mils of hydrochloric acid and this is just to stabilize the mercury. So mercury and nitric acid alone will adsorb to any plastic components. So we wanted to make sure we were avoiding um, any of those problems and um, able to recover all of the elements that were in the samples. These are the parameters that we used for um, the microwave digestion. We did use a higher temperature than you would normally use um, for other sample types, just to make sure that we are um, completely digesting this larger sample size and that we're minimizing the residual carbon um, because that would cause greater interferences in our lower UV range where our uh, mercury and arsenic are going to be located for ICP OES. We also used um, more robust microwave digestion vessels um, than the normal ones just because they needed to hold up to the higher temperature and pressure um, requirements for this. So we used the iPrep vessels from CEM. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Alicia to talk a little bit more about how you can optimize your microwave digestion technique to get the best analysis. Thank you, Autumn, uh, for that kind of lead into my part of this presentation. And thank you to Inorganic Ventures for um, inviting CEM to join this on this webinar. This has been an exciting project, and I'm glad we're getting the opportunity to present it in this format. Um, so I'm going to take a little bit of a tangent from this particular um, application that we're talking about and dive a little bit deeper into that residual carbon that Autumn referenced in that last slide. Um, and what I'm kind of kind of depicting here with this little graphic is that residual carbon can be a little bit sneaky. Um, it can kind of be that thing that you didn't know what was causing the problem and, and so forth. So I, I think it's relevant to take a little bit more time to talk about that and how you can avoid um, residual carbon being an interference um, during your digestion process. So ideally, to get a complete digestion, we need to remove all residual carbon from the sample. And to be able to do that, we need to um, be at an appropriate temperature and appropriate hold time during the microwave digestion. And digestion is really unique in the fact that the visual tells us so much about how the digestion actually um, went. So at the end of the day, we want a clear and colorless solution. And if it's clear and colorless, that's going to tell us a lot about that we probably had a complete digestion and we're gonna get the results that we expected to get. Um, and I just bring that a point because we're gonna take some time looking at some pictures um, during my slides. But if we go um, now and look at the method that we ran for this study, we can go to the next slide. Okay, um, so, 
Autumn already went over the method that they used for this particular study where they're using the higher sample size um, for to reach the detection limits of the ICP OES. Um, and she also referenced the fact that the standard method is often used with ICP MS. In fact, the first action um, method for AOAC that is for metals in cannabis and cannabis infused products indeed is a ICP MS method. So for this residual carbon study, we did follow that method for this, and Autumn did mention the um, differences here, but I just want to reiterate um, what we used for this study. But everything that we're talking about, these concepts of the higher temperature, um, are indeed true for both of these studies um, that we're talking about here, whether your intention was for ICP OES or your intention for ICP MS. At the end of the day, we're giving you options to fit your needs of your lab, whatever the equipment is that you have in your lab. So in this case, we did use a half gram sample size. Um, nine mils of nitric acid and one mil of HCl. You do need to be aware of that volume of HCl. You don't want to use too much. I'm not going to dig too deep into that. Um, we're going to have a question and answer after this, but also we have, this is just a tidbit of this um, presentation here. So um, we could definitely provide some extensive, you know, data beyond in the study. I just wanted to kind of give a little insight into this. And um, Autumn mentioned that they use the um, IPREP vessels. However, and that is indeed important for the sample size that they ran and the um, temperature that they were running at. For the study that we did here, we were able to do this entire study in our um, Express Plus vessels. So again, just options to fit the needs of your lab, what's gonna fit your sample types. So if we go to the next slide, we'll see the different samples we did run for this study. So we looked at two NIST SRMs, pine needles and plant four, which is part of the CANA um, QAP study. And so, um, you know, we always want to do some sort of validation and we want to choose sample types that are as relevant to the samples that we're looking at as possible. And I think you'll see um, that it, in the data that we they behave very similarly. And then as far as the sample types that we're looking at, we looked at a cannabis flower and then we looked at a CBD isolate. And in all of our work, and we've done tons of different type of cannabis infused products um, and cannabis, um, different cannabis products, and can CBD isolate tends to be one of the more challenging to digest. Um, so we picked um, just as a representative um, one here, one of the more challenging ones. So if we go to the next slide, we can see um, some of the data for the um, carbon content in these four different sample types that we looked at. And in this case, we did use an inorganic ventures standard um, for the carbon um, to be able to receive this data. And what I want to bring your attention to is that regardless of the sample, um, from the two NIST SRMs to the isolate to the flower, at 180 degrees C, which tends to be a fairly common 180 degrees C should be good. Um, you have more carbon content than what you see at 210 and then 240. And indeed, as we increase temperature, we are um, decreasing the amount of carbon present. So the temperature does have a direct effect on this and is important. Um, and then again, we're gonna look at pictures in just a moment that really bring home this concept that at 180 degrees C, you are not removing all the residual carbon um, from the sample for the types of samples we're looking at here, cannabis flower, um, CBD isolate, and then furthermore, um, cannabis infused products itself. Um, so I'm just gonna um, finish my part by looking at some pictures to kind of bring this home. But again, this was a complete study where we have all sorts of data that can be provided upon request um, because um, the actual data of the different elements um, shows a really nice story as well. And at the end of the day, um, for a half gram sample size, um, 210 degrees, um, we found to be the most optimal. And again, that's what got written into that first action method for AOAC. So if we move to the next slide, we can look a little bit of some pictures. So here is the cannabis flower. And what you're looking at here, and I know they're not the prettiest pictures in the world. Um, it, it's hard to get a beautiful picture if you're looking down into the Express Plus vessel, because that's what we're looking at here. So you have a 
pretty narrow tube um, that you're trying to take a picture down into. But what you can see, if you look at the bottom of that tube at 180 degrees C, there's clearly stuff there, right? We're able to focus on something because there's something at the bottom of that vessel. Where at 210 degrees C, it's kind of just a blurry picture. There's nothing there to focus on. So we can't, you know, really, um, it's good. We don't have anything to take a picture of. Um, so that's just a very clear visual difference. And this is just looking at the vessel after the digestion of that sample. But we move, move to the next slide. This is the CBD isolate. And I had mentioned that the CBD isolate is even a more challenging sample than the flower itself. And I think you can see that here with the 180 degree C, it's even more evident that clearly there's a lot of material left behind there. You physically see it. And then at 210 degrees, you're not seeing it anymore. So if we move to the next slide, now we're looking at the actual digest. Um, and Autumn mentioned that um, the dilution factor, right? That's a part of this whole study as well. And, and they went to a lower um, dilution factor or rather more concentrated. And uh, we went from 0.5 grams to 50 grams for this study. But even when you do that, you can see that color difference. So for the cannabis flower, you see a little bit of yellowing um, there at 180 degrees C. And for the CBD isolate, it is very obvious that you see this yellow content where just at 210 degrees C, um, it, you got completely clear. Um, and again, we are able to reach this 210 degrees C with the half gram sample size with our Mars Express Plus vessels. Um, so that opens up um, some different options in the vessels where with the study we're talking about here at that 230, you do want to be running the eye prep vessels and that larger sample size that Autumn um, already mentioned. So I hope you've just seen here how important the temperature is to getting a complete digestion, which is obviously important to reaching the detection limits of what you're looking for at the end of the day. So with that, um, I'm going to pass it back to Autumn to um, cover the complete study of this ICP OES that we've looked at. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alicia. CEM has been um, such a huge help throughout this study um, and just giving us some really good recommendations on um, both the digestion and um, different spike strategies um, and final analysis. So we really appreciate them. And um, they were a really huge part of making this study a success. Um, so with those samples, um, some of them, we went ahead and spiked them with different levels of the elements that we were looking for. Um, and we based those spikes on the California action limits um, for inhalable cannabis products. Um, and that was just because California's limits were um, one of the lowest at the time. And um, so we wanted to make sure that this method would be appropriate for um, any of the labs that would be trying to analyze heavy metals in these cannabis products. Um, so for arsenic and cadmium, that level in the um, plant is 0.2 ppm. Um, for lead, it's 0.5. And for mercury, it's 0.1. We went ahead and lowered the lead level in our analysis to the same as arsenic and cadmium, um, just to make sure that we could analyze all of these at the levels that um, people would, be, would care about um, in subsequent studies. So for our mid spike, we spiked at the level of the California action limits. Um, and then we did a low spike at half level and a high spike at one and a half times the limit. Um, so this helped us in ensuring that we were recovering. Um, we were able to see these elements in the samples, but also helped us identify any um, contamination or uh, loss that may have been occurring um, to make sure that we were able to analyze all of these accurately. So for our spike solution, um, we used a in-house CRM, um, certified reference material that Inorganic Ventures made. Um, it was a 20 ppm of everything except for mercury, which was at, again, the half level, um, which will be the case throughout all the study. Mercury will just be at, at half the concentration of all the other analytes. Um, we made this in a 2% HCL matrix, again, just to make sure that that mercury is going to be stable um, and won't have any issues with plastic adsorption. And we made it at a really high concentration compared to um, what we will need in our final samples, um, just to make sure that that spike level is kept small um, and it's not gonna have any matrix effects. So 
the spike levels in the sample ended up being, I believe, 5, 10, and 15 microliters. Um, so we did use a micro pipette, but again, we did all of this by weight. Um, so we didn't rely on volumes for any of these things. We um, took, took all of our weights as we were doing the prep for um, the samples and the blanks. <clears throat> so then we had to pick an internal standard. Um, because we were gonna, we knew we were gonna see a lot of matrix effects um, from this highly concentrated sample type, um, we wanted to make sure that we were accounting for that by applying um, an internal standard correction. We ended up choosing scandium, um, which we spiked at 100 ppb, which is higher than what our analytes are at. Um, but we wanted to keep relatively close to the concentration while still maintaining um, a healthy, um, good intensity for the scandium um, to make sure that we we're applying the, the correction effectively. We initially um, were going to use yttrium because it's a very common internal standard and we didn't expect it to be in our samples. Um, but I actually, before we started the study, read in some of the literature that yttrium can be present in uh, these types of samples in cannabis and hemp. So um, I talked to the folks at CEM and they, they confirmed that they had seen this in some of the samples. So I'm glad that I went with scandium because because um, you can see the graph here is uh, an example of one of the samples. I monitored a yttrium line just to see if there indeed was yttrium, um, and there definitely was. So um, scandium is a good option, but you just want to make sure that you pick something that um, is not going to be in any of your samples, um, that's not going to cause any interferences or be interfered on by any of your components. Um, something that has, again, a good signal, you need a good intensity that you can um, reliably used to um, apply the ratio to your analytes. Um, and ideally, you want something that behaves similar to your analytes in the plasma. <clears throat> so next, we had to look at matrix matching. Um, so for the um, acid concentrations, one of the kind of more general rules um, that sometimes use is that you account for half of the nitric acid being consumed in the reaction. Um, so the final concentration would be about 33%. Um, you could do a, a more um, accurate confirmation by doing a titration um, to, to matrix match that a little bit more accurately. But um, for this study, we just used the 33% nitric. Um, again, we always add the HCl to stabilize mercury. Um, and so we tried running it with just matrix matching those uh, acids, but we had some issues with um, carbon especially. So we ran a scan um, of, the, of one of the samples or a few of the samples um, and analyzed the carbon content. Um, so we found in our original study, when we had a lower temperature, um, there was about 1500 ppm, which is what you see an example of um, in the in the graph there. Um, but in our final, where we did 230, there was only about 1150 ppm carbon. Um, so we wanted to see if this was going to um, fix those, those matrix matching issues that we had in the lower UV range, particularly for arsenic. Um, so arsenic was kind of the, the big um, focus for this study, just because it was gonna be the most difficult to analyze. Um, and quantify reliably at those levels. So before we added the carbon, we were seeing about a 5 ppb high bias on, on arsenic. Um, so what we did was we ran an analysis of um, just the nitric acid and a 30 ppb arsenic um, in that matrix as the standards. And then we ran the same uh, standards, a blank and a um, 30 ppb arsenic, that had the same level of carbon um, as what we had in our samples. And we found that this did indeed um, incur a high bias on arsenic 189, um, which is really the only reliable line that we could use for arsenic, um, especially at these levels. So we confirmed that um, adding that carbon did uh, account for that matrix interference. To make sure that the arsenic wasn't a contaminant in our carbon source, um, we ran 
it, it was a KHP potassium hydrogen phthalate was the carbon source that we use because it's an organic source um, and it's it's stable in these type of matrices. Um, so we ran it at a really high level um, that ended up being about 25,000 ppm carbon from KHP um, and analyzed multiple arsenic lines to ensure that there wasn't actually arsenic present and that we were actually seeing an interference on 189. We also matrix matched for calcium um, because in the scan, we found that there was a very high level of calcium around 600 ppm, um, which isn't surprising from a plant source. Um, so we went ahead and matrix matched for that as well. So these were our final um, calibration standard concentrations. Um, we had a blank, a one PPB, 5 ppb and a 10 ppb um, standard with mercury, again, at the half levels of those. Um, and again, we did use high purity nitric acid because we wanted to minimize the lead contamination um, that you generally see with nitric acid. Um, again, 33% nitric acid, 2% HCl to matrix match the acids, um, 1150 ppm carbon from KHP and 600 ppm calcium. Um, and that was from a calcium nitrate um, concentrate that we have here at IV. And then of course we had our 100 ppb scandium as the internal standard. <clears throat> so we ran these on two different types of ICP OES optic systems. Um, the first one that we originally planned the study for was an ORCA system, um, which is a spectro optic system. Um, so this type of system generally can see better um, detection limits in the lower UV range, which is where, again, um, arsenic and mercury live. So we originally were going to do it just on this system, but um, a lot of folks use an shell type optic system. Um, so most other ICP OES systems do use this type of optic system. So we didn't want to limit this to um, an application for only those that have an ORCA system. Um, we wanted to make sure that people with any type of ICP OES um, could reasonably achieve um, the results that we were seeing. So this is a sample intro system that we used. Um, so this was a big part of why we were able to increase our sensitivity the way that we were. Um, this is a TSP, Texas Scientific Products, um, nebulizer spray chamber setup. It's called the Optimus Vortex um, nebulizer spray chamber. So it's a very unique design. I have a, a photo there of a, a zoomed in um, picture of the nebulizer tip. Um, so what that does is it creates an optimized uh, mist pattern within the spray chamber to where you're able to get um, a lot more of those um, components that you're looking for into the plasma and you're able to analyze them and see them at lower levels than you would with a traditional um, concentric nebulizer um, and cyclonic spray chamber setup. So the spray chamber actually has a little notch, if you can see in the top um, right corner of those pictures, where the knob of the nebulizer fits into. So you can make sure that you have um, an optimal um, orientation of those each time that you run the analysis and you don't have to worry about um, trying to pull the nebulizer in and out to get the pattern of the spray correct. We used a regular just normal um, quartz system um, for the torch. And the rest of our system, we just used everything that we normally use. Um, we did use a larger um, parasolic pump tubing size. It was a 0.89 millimeter inner diameter, which is the orange orange, um, with a pump speed of 30 RPM because the um, probably the optimal um, sample flow rate for this type of nebulizer is gonna be higher than what you would use for a concentric. So this is about a two mil per minute flow rate. Um, you, could, you could have a lower flow rate with this nebulizer, but it's really important that you do have a pretty high sample flow um, of about one and a half mil per minute or so or more, um, just because the nebulizer is not self-aspirating. Um, so you're gonna get more of an effect from the pulsations if you're kind of starving that nebulizer of sample. Um, and this was able to about double the sensitivity um, for these analytes and for many other analytes that we've studied actually um, versus a traditional concentric setup. <clears throat> so once we had our um, standards ready and we um, had our 
system setup, we needed to optimize the instrument parameters to make sure that we're getting maximal sensitivity. Um, so we went through one by one uh, of these parameters and adjusted them um, using a scan mode or real-time uh, reading mode to see how the sensitivity was affected um, for arsenic. Because again, arsenic was gonna be our primary concern for this analysis. So this is an example of one that we did on our Agilent system, which is the a shell optic system. Um, and we found that the maximal um, sensitivity was achieved at 0.58 liters per minute nebulizer flow rate. So this is lower than um, what you are probably typically used to. Normally um, for our concentrics, we run them around 0.7 liters per minute. Um, so make sure that you go in and adjust that and it can have a huge impact on the sensitivity that you're able to achieve. We also did this for the pump speed. Um, so we adjusted it just slightly um, to see where we were getting the best sensitivity. Um, and then we did multiple replicates to confirm that we weren't just seeing um, a one-time anomaly um, for one of those. And also for the RF power. Um, so the RF power was a little bit higher than um, what we would normally use for, for an analysis as well. And so that does increase your intensity for the analyze, but it's also gonna increase your background. Um, so just make sure that you're accounting for the background and um, calculating for the overall counts from your sample. Um, so a background corrected um, intensity is what you're looking at. These were the final instrument parameters that we used. So very similar between both systems. Um, the ORCA nebulizer flow rate was optimized at a little bit higher um, than on the Eschel system for whatever reason. Um, and we've seen this with other nebulizers too, when we've gone through and doing um, and done some optimizations like this. Um, but most everything else is the same. I did want to point out um, the bulk of our kind of time went into optimizing the shell system just because um, we were going to have more issues with sensitivity um, for that arsenic. So um, the integration time for the shell system is a little bit longer. However, um, we did the the analysis on the ORCA first, and um, having a longer integration time would probably be beneficial for the ORCA system too, just to um, improve your um, precision. So these were the results that we found um, for our spikes. So we were able to recover the mid and high spikes, which again were at um, the levels for California action limits and at one and a half times the California action limits, as well as our low spikes um, within the AOAC SMPRs for uh, heavy metals and cannabis. So those SMPRs are 80% to 115% for mid and high spikes um, and 60% to 115% for low spikes. So we were well within those parameters um, for all of our spikes. Um, and I have it broken up by element there in the bottom um, table. So um, yeah, we got really good results for all of these, um, and I was especially shocked about the low spikes that we were able to um, achieve those recoveries and see what we knew was actually there. Um, we also ran a robustus study. So we ran um, our initial calibration, and then we ran um, samples that were spiked at 3 ppb um, for all elements except mercury, which is at 1.5 ppb. Um, and then at a higher level of 25 ppb um, for all of those. And we, we ran 24 samples all mixed up as far as concentrations um, to make sure that we weren't seeing any drift in one direction or the other. Um, and overall, there was no drift for any of the elements. These were our calibration curves. Um, the Echelle system uh, or the Agilent is on the left. Um, and the ORCA spectro system is on the right. Um, so our calibration curves looked really good. Um, we did not force them through zero. Um, so we were able to put the one PPB standard um, on the curve, um, which was a vital part of ensuring that we're able to quantify at that level. So our detection limits um, were really good. They were actually really similar on both systems. Um, so we got around 1.7 ppb for arsenic, 0.07 for cadmium, 
2 ppb for lead and 0.3 in mercury. So if you take that 15x dilution factor um, back to the dry hemp uh, basis, that is the equivalent of 30 ppb arsenic and lead, um, 1 ppb cadmium, and 5 ppb mercury. Um, so these are these are well within the limits um, for analyzing at the levels that we're trying to see. Um, and these were based on three standard deviation detection limits on 10 replicates of the blanks. <clears throat> so this slide has a lot of information on it, um, but the main, the main reason I wanted to show this is um, we went ahead and spiked some of the samples uh, very close to what we expected to be the detection limits to see if those were actually recoverable. Um, and again, this is detection limits, not um, quantitation limits. So these are gonna be where your RSD is expected to be around 30%. Um, so we were really happy with a lot of these results that we were actually able to see uh, one and two PPB spikes um, in the samples. Um, and again, the bottom just reminds you um, of the California action limits compared to um, our detection limits that we were able to see and, and what we actually found um, in these samples. So just to wrap up, um, it's really important to uh, optimize your digestion conditions to be able to get a complete digestion um, and get your best possible analysis to make sure that you're able to recover everything um, and keep a clean uh, digestion process. Um, again, the detection limits within the range of one PPB to 30 PPB are well below um, the inhalable limits, which are 0.1 to 0.5 ppm. Um, <clears throat> The detection limits potential was shown really on the previous slide where we spiked at or even below the detection limit for some of these and we're able to um, recover those or see the difference in the counts um, from those spikes. One thing I wanted to point out, um, we did use a high purity lead, uh, nitric acid, um, but we did still have a little bit of lead contamination in there because the acid concentration was so high. Uh, as a reminder, it was, 10 mils of nitric acid diluted to a final of only 15 grams, um, which ended up being only about 12 milliliters. So all of that lead that is gonna be in your nitric acid um, is really gonna affect your detection limits and um, the level of contamination. So make sure that you're using a really high purity nitric acid. Um, and finally, this method is an accurate, reliable, um, robust method and can save um, labs costs if they don't have an ICP mass spec system um, or if they have both and um, they wanna use an OES instead of a mass spec for analyzing heavy metals in hemp and cannabis. So that'll right conclude up. the presentation. Um, we do have a lot of technical re resources on our website. Um, if you go to inorganicventures.com, um, CEM has a, a lot of information on any type of digestion really that you could ever wanna do. Um, so make sure that you reach out to them for any questions on that. We also have a cannabis flipbook on our website um, that goes through a lot of the issues that you may see when analyzing these heavy metals. Um, so make sure you check that out if you're having any issues um, with these types of analysis in your lab. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Brandon and um, we'll go through the Q&A. All right, I appreciate it. A uh, huge shout out and thank you to uh... Autumn and Alicia and and uh, IV and uh, CEM Corporation and just everybody behind the scenes like Grace and Keller. Um, you know, we couldn't put this on without y'all. So um, without further ado, we'll, we'll go through the questions. This first one's here for you, Autumn. Uh, mm -hmm. It says, it's a question regarding the final nitric acid volume percent after mm -hmm. dilution. As the dilution factor is so little, then acid content will be relatively high we use to use two to 5% nitric acid. Yeah, so that's that's really um, typical. So if you're analyzing on mass spec, you definitely don't wanna have um, that high acid content. Um, we, did, we, ha we didn't do a study on the final actual concentration of nitric, um, but a lot of that is gonna be consumed in your digestion process. So those brown fumes that you see um, coming off of those organics and those um, digestions that you do with nitric, those are um, nitrogen dioxide gas. Um, so a lot of that nitric will be consumed, but it was still um, quite a high concentration of acid. So you want to you want to be careful with that as well, um, and make sure that you're allowing 
those to vent properly. Um, even after you do the dilution, it's not a very big dilution, as you mentioned. Um, so yeah, you will have quite a high acid content. Um, but if you wanted to confirm that, you could definitely do um, a titration just to ensure um, that your, your matrix matching that correctly. But yeah, 2 to 5% nitric is much more typical um, of, analysis, of an analysis concentration. Um, these are just, this is a very kind of specific um, application where we just wanted to minimize the dilution factor as much as possible. Um, and unfortunately, we did need that high of a nitric uh, content to fully digest that one gram of sample. All right, the uh, next question, Autumn mentioned that she tested at a low temp of 230 degrees. What temp would you normally use in, uh, in other analyses? Yeah, I mean, I'll take that one. Um, our standard recommendation for ICP MS and the standard half gram of sample would be 210 degrees. And that comes back to that residual um, carbon that we're talking about at 180, you're just not removing all of that. But by 210, you are. Um, the risk with going um, hotter, using our standard um, method, which is a half a gram um, and the higher dilution factor for ICP, MS, and on our Mars um, Express Plus vessels, you can start to have an opportunity to lose some of the uh, volatiles at the higher temperature. Um, so given the typical um, method that you would run, which is the um, AOAC approved method, um, we would recommend 210 degrees C, and that is for any cannabis, cannabis flower and any cannabis infused um, product that you have. Okay, uh, next question. In order for the method to work with ICP OES rather than ICP mass spec, one gram of the sample size is needed. Do you have data for residual carbon for one gram sample size of cannabis or plant tissue? Um, hi, Sergey. Um, Sergey Lakin was um, a big part of this project as well. He's from Texas Scientific Products and we worked very closely on this. Um, so, the only, the only data that I have um, is just from those rough sample scans um, where we saw about 1150 ppm of carbon. Um, but other than that, I'm not sure if, if CEM has done any residual carbon studies on um, that big of a sample type. So, so no, we don't have that data right now. Um, this actual data that I've talked about here was recently done um, in around the November timeframe um, where we focused on the um, half a gram sample, but we're continuing that study. Um, so certainly I think this is something we can look into. I, I will say back to that visual, um, I think there is some residual carbon still in the um, the sample with the one gram sample type, um, but we're adjusting that right with the um, you know, standard and so forth. So there's other ways to look at it. And there could be opportunities where you're still getting very good results back, even with some um, minor residual carbon that you're adjusting with um, for this type of ICP OES analysis needing the large sample size. Okay. Um... Please continue to submit questions. Uh, we have a few minutes left. Uh, we're on our last one for now. Uh, the last question posted so far is, do you show any recovery percent for the CRMs? Uh, and, and they indicated that, that they might've missed it. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. That was um, part of the study that we wanted to continue um, and do perform the method on um, a NIST CRM, probably one of the ones that um, was mentioned by Alicia um, in one of the former slides, but we did not um, do that with this particular study. I will but it is something it, that we need to do. <laughs> yeah, and if you're interested in the data for the um, method that I showed, then that is available on our website. Um, you can look at the application note where we did a wide variety of different, um, you know, cannabis flower and cannabis infused products, including the isolate that I talked about too. So that data is available. Uh, is removal of residual carbon always required? 
Um, um, yeah, kind of um, talked about that in, in the last bit. And, and the answer is no. I mean, it, it, it's it's what's fit for purpose for your analysis. It depends on the samples and metals that you're looking for and whether that's going to interfere and, um, and so forth. Um, so it is recommended for a complete digestion, um, you know, and for the full suite of um, elements that you could be looking at, um, best practice would be to fully have a complete digestion. But there's a lot of cases where that may not be possible. And um, you still be in a, are able to obtain the data that you're needed for your um, application in your lab. I was just going to say, you could also um, try matrix matching for that as, as well as you can. I use KHP um, for our analysis. I know some people have used um, methanol um, or other carbon sources, but um, just make sure that you're accounting for it and that you're aware of any interferences that are going to be there, um, especially on OES, just because um, in that lower UV range, again, for mercury and arsenic, um, you're definitely going to see some of those er interferences and have that um, elevated background signal suppression. So, yeah, mm -hmm. as long as you're accounting for it, um, I think you could, again, whatever's fit for purpose, but um, you could, there are some other options. Yeah, and to add to that, we did look into the, you know, common practice is to add some like um, alcohol um, to it, um, as Autumn mentioned, and um, we have some data on that too, on showing how that performs. Um, so if you were interested in more. All right, last question. Um, if you guys have additional questions, feel free to reach out to us. We're, we'll be happy to answer them off the session. But the last question is, have you digested any other cannabis materials such as gummies or lotions? Um, on, on our end, yes. Um, so um, so um, again, um, that data is available um, on our website. I, I think Otto mentioned um, you know, we've digested pretty much anything you can really think of at, at this point. Um, so we have lots and lots of um, you know methods and um, data on different types of sample types, but particularly in the cannabis sector, yes, um, we've covered a very large suite of different samples, including lotions and gummies. All right, that'll conclude our session here today. Um, I'd like to send a special thank you, the most important thank you to all of you who have joined our webinar. Um, we appreciate it so much uh, to continue doing these things. Um, look forward to our, our next uh, session. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys. <laughs>